Going to start. I'm going to start with um, one from the Green Street family, and then, you know, when I conclude mine, um, there'll be other people who will come up and give their tributes um, on this day. So, um, I'm Yvonne Green Street, um, and Rosamund Tago was my godmother. Um, but this tribute is from myself and my siblings, Ian, Ivor, and Isabel. And when we talked about Rosamund Tago, we came up with three words that we felt um, symbolized what she meant to us as we were growing up. She really was the essence of glamour, generosity, and compassion. Rosamund and my mother, Miranda, grew up together in London 
under the watchful eye of Auntie Chris. They lived more or less as sisters, later welcoming their cousins Washia and Eunice into the fold. And Auntie Rosman took on the role of looking after family members with energy and enthusiasm. Her flat at Harrington Gardens and later Glenhow Gardens was always open to us. All that we needed to do was knock on her door. She'd say, come in, but you can't go into the kitchen, just go sit in the living room. <laughs> you did not have to spend a long time with Auntie Rosman to realize that she believed in living life to the full. From her insistence on having a home in the right postcode, and for those of you that are not aficionados of London, this meant that that postcode had to be within walking distance of Paris. She also spent holidays in exotic locations that we could only dream of. She talked to me about holidays in Malta and Monaco, and as a young girl growing up, I thought, this is the life. <laughs> And she really was a larger than life figure. Occasionally, we were very, very well behaved. We were let loose in her wardrobe, and this introduced us to a taste of glamour in trying on luxurious fur coats. And in fact, um, Dr. Glee suggested to me that I might suit one of her fur coats. <laughs> in trying on her luxurious fur coats, holding her expensive handbags, and wearing designer shoes, one was immediately transported to the high life. You know, as she got older and her wardrobes and, and cupboards overflowed, she resisted all of our efforts to help her downsize. And as I reflected on this, I wondered if each of her possessions brought her memories of happier times. Rosman was incredibly generous and she always made herself available to support family and friends. When we were young children, Auntie Rosman sacrificed countless hours over our summer holidays, looking after us at her London flat and water garden, just a stone's throw away from here, to enable my mother to complete all of her shopping requirements for the following year in garden. We were a pretty rowdy bunch, and we invariably left behind some scars of our stay perhaps a white rug stained with ketchup, chipped glass as we raced around her apartment, or a broken ornament. But you know, Auntie Rosman always welcomed us back. Rosman keenly followed the trajectory of our lives and encouraged our success. She was particularly excited by my decision to study medicine and didn't hesitate to recommend me in glowing terms, embarrassingly glowing terms, to anyone and everyone that she believed could be helpful to my career. When my elder son, Laddie, who's just flown from San Francisco to make sure that he can be with us today, when he was born, Rosman was my first visitor at University College Hospital, and she brought not just flowers, but uh, some firmly held and freely shared opinions on parenting techniques. <laughs> you know, I was a bit of a nerd, that's what they called them back in the day, and observing me carefully studying a book on how to be the best mother and raise a perfect child, she dismissed my maternal approach as academic <laughs> and proceeded to show me exactly how I should bath, feed, and dress our baby. And in this process, she transitioned from being Auntie Rosmond to becoming what we all know her as, Granny Ros. Granny Ros's generous spirit was accompanied by, I'm sure many of you all recall, a pretty frank disposition. You know, her perspectives on things like beauty, politics, other aspects of life, were not always consistent exactly with mine. But her love for me, for us, was never, never, ever in doubt. Granny Rose was our sister, my mother's sister, our aunt, Ian, Iva, Isabel, my aunt, mother, my godmother, and grandmother to many, many grandchildren. She was also a highly respected radiographer and she dedicated her professional life to serving patients at the Royal Marsden Hospital. And we heard 
much of this earlier on today um, at, at uh, church. She was compassionate to a fault, and nothing when it came to patience was too much trouble for her. And she was always there as a beacon of hope and a rock of comfort to family, friends and patients who were diagnosed with cancer. And I, and I found a poem that really summed it up for me, and I'll, I'll read it out for you now. When a calming, quiet presence was all that was needed, she was there. In the excitement and miracle of birth, Lali, or in the mystery and loss of life, she was there. When a silent glance could uplift a patient, a family member, or a friend, she was there. At those times when the unexplainable needed to be explained, complex challenges of having cancer, she was there. When the situation demanded a swift foot and a sharp mind, you can bet she was there. When a gentle touch, a firm push, or an encouraging, sometimes disciplining word was needed, she was there. To embrace the woes of the world willingly and offer hope, she was there. And now that she has been called to be with the Lord, she is there. Amen. Granny Ros, <coughs> rest in perfect peace and rise in glory. Thank you. This is a short history of my how I um, made friendship with Rosamond and how I managed to find her again in my later life. It was autumn 1961. I had finished school at a boarding school in Kent. My parents were in the north of Burma, which is quite a distance away as far as plane flights and connections are concerned. Um, it's the other end of the world. My dad worked there for a British mining company. My medical student brother in London and I found a flat in a road you might just know from today. It's called Hoop Lane. And as my mum was flying over to see her two boys, who she hadn't seen for quite a long time, we found a flat there for the three of us to stay in. Soon after her arrival, she suffered a stroke and died in a hospital the same night. I was 17. <clears throat> my brother and I were in shock. We telegrammed my father to say that my mother was seriously ill because if, she, if we had said that she had died, it was great to take him a week to 10 days to get to England and it would have been torn out. So we decided to send him a telegram just saying she was seriously ill. He arrived a week later. My mother had already been buried in Hoop Lane. The same road, I didn't even know there was a cemetery there. And she died and she was taken to be buried 200 yards from where we were living. My father, my brother and I spent Xmas with friends in Sweden that year. And then my dad returned to Burma because he needed to get back to his job. My brother returned to St. Thomas's Medical School in London and stayed in rooms there. And I really had arrived back from Sweden with nowhere to live. My dad's cousin, Nick, who I remember as fondly as I remember Rosamond. Um, he had helped organize my mum's funeral because we were just basically 17 and 19 year olds and didn't know how to do any of this. 
And Nick was renting a room at Dorset Square. And although he lived with his family in a house in North London, um, I'm not absolutely sure why he had the room in Dorset Square. I leave that to your imagination. <laughs> he said I could have the room for three pounds a week, which I should then put in a drawer. <coughs> Open brackets, he very rarely collected the money. But there were conditions. Oh, I've forgotten what I was going to say there, but I'll carry on. I found a job as an office boy with an architectural firm and I earned five pounds a week and I would stint myself on food so as to pay the three pounds to Nick. Rosamond and Auntie Chris were next door um, and we'd just say hello and there wouldn't be no further contact. Um, Rosamond went to, on a Sunday, to a local store to buy something to the stations, stationery and she came back and she knocked on my door and she said, were you at a demonstration in Trafalgar Square? And I said, yes. She said, I thought it was you. She said, your face is, you're on the front page of the Sunday Observer. <laughs> <laughs> so I decide I'll invest for a change in my own newspaper and I go to the newsagent and there I am on the... At that time, the Observer only had one photograph, I think, and that was on the front page. And that was with me, like this, a policeman looking at me, and South Africa House of the Distance. Now, there were a lot of people actually demonstrating in Charles Square, I have to make that clear. But whoever took that, whichever journalist took that photo, basically just had me looking at a policeman aggressively and angrily and South Africa House and Protestants. <clears throat> that was the start, that was the start of the friendship with Rosamond and Auntie Chris. Um, At the time of my mother's death, I had walked out of um, the architectural school, um, which I was going to, which is the most famous school in the world. It's had Norman Foster and Richard Rogers come out of it. Not that I would have come out with such fame, but um, I just couldn't cope with that. So I now went for an interview I needed to have um, to finish my career at some point. And so when I felt ready, um, I looked at the Oxford School of Architecture and thought it was a possibility. Rosamond and her uncle, Kojo, drove her and I to Oxford and I went for an interview with the principal. And when I came out of the interview and the principal had opened the door and was letting me out, Rosamond, then, who was sitting down, said, Alan, I don't want you to go there. That man was gazing at your bottom. <laughs> and Greg, and Greg, I think, I'm sorry if I've offended anyone. But I think women have much better reasons. Rosamond turned out to be. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We can't hear you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the bed, and like a good brother, I slept on the carpeted floor because I absolutely adored her. And I'd never had a sister, and now I had one. On one occasion, I invited Rosamond to a ball at Blenheim Palace. The band was Humphrey Littleton and the Duke of Marlborough spoke to Rosamond and told her that she was looking stunning. Decades later, when I mentioned the Blenheim Ball to her while she was in the care home, her eyes would light up and she would talk about it. 
she would remember everything about the party at the <coughs> house. The Duke of Marlborough, who I knew, yeah. he had an eye for a pretty woman. Oh, right. He was married. He was married to an American, little girl, the old Duke. And he was very tall, but Rosamond was quite tall. Oh, right. So he had a good taste in the music. Oh, right. <laughs> I, I lived, I was born in Woods, I lived there my whole life. Oh, right, right. Yes. So you know the whole... I know the whole thing. Uh, Our house well. was opposite the front palace gates. Yes, yes. Right. Well, the first thing I did when I came... Can you hear me? The first thing I did when I came back to London and started to earn money was to go into that supermarket. Thank you. Was to, the first thing I did when I came back to London and I'm starting to earn some money was to go into that smallish supermarket at the side of um, Gloucester... Whatever the road was, Gloucester Road. Um, and... and um, by whatever I thought was the right Auntie Chris and Rosamond uh, would need. It was just like somebody's son earning his money for his first time. He doesn't have his mother, his father's abroad, and, and he buys his parents something as a return. Um, I lost touch with Rosamond when she moved to the Water Gardens. I don't know how many of you would remember that. It was the Inn Tower block near the Edgware Road, absolutely beautiful, and they were renting a flat at the top. Um, I would like to give you a funny story of um, Rosamond and I and my car. When I was in Oxford, I bought a second-hand car. It was called a Sunbeam Talbot for the older people who were here. Um, so one day in Dorset Square, I went with Rosamond to pick up my car and um, got into it. And as I was driving, another car drove them across on a minor road and we had a car crash. Um, I called the police because that's what you did when you had a car crash. <laughs> and they, they, it was an unwise thing to do, but they asked if they could see my license <laughs> within 24 hours. So I went back to my room in Dorset Square, fished out my license, and I thought, oh dear, this is the Burmese license which my dad has paid his friend, the chief of police, in the <laughs> <of Burma. laughs> to give me. The picture of me is of a schoolboy. <laughs> it's not eaten. I think I might have a problem. So I staple something into it. I'll tell you later. <laughs> and I said to Rosalind, can you come with me to go to the police station in Barrow? And she said, yeah, okay. But when she realised what was going on with my driving license, she was getting very nervous. <laughs> and she said she felt the rain during the week. Um, so anyway, we got to the the um, police station and the cop was sitting there said, bit old, isn't it? I said, it's been renewed. He said, where's that? I said, it's a slip of paper stapled in there. So he copies all the Burmese squiggles from the slip of paper into his book. <laughs> and we, we, we left building and Rotterdam said, what was on that Burmese paper? I said it said dried plums. <laughs> <laughs> In that same police station, Stephen Ward was down below, temporarily apprehended. So it, it, I'm glad I didn't have to join. Um, Okay, well, I'm very privileged to have been accepted as a part of Rosamond's family, and I shall always remember her because.
Shinji Anshin played a very important part in me coping with some tragedy in my life. Um, I forgot about Rotterdam because I had my own family over a period of years. And a few years ago I thought, Rosamund deserved more than what I've given her. And I must try and find her. So I won't tell you how I managed to get a phone number, but I did. And it was by really pushing and pressing somebody who wasn't really supposed to give it to me. Having got that number, I, I rang Rosamund, and she had always had a good memory. So we had a chat on the phone, and she gave me her address. And I said, uh, why can't I take you for lunch? But I had no realization of what her physical condition was. And she said, no, I'm not able to do it, etc. And I left it for a bit. And then I thought, I better call her again, and I'll go there and visit her. So I phoned again, no answer. Phone the next day, no answer. This went on for about a week, and I thought something is a bit amiss. So I went to the address that she'd given me, and the flat looked empty. Rang the bell, absolutely no sound. And I thought, what shall I do now? So I found a bit of paper in my pocket, I scribbled a note to whom it may concern. If you know where Rotterdam is, could you please? Let me know, my intentions are only good. I put that through the main door. There's about eight flats in the building and I was just hoping for the best. About a week later, I got an anonymous message on my mobile. Rosamond is at such and such a care home in West London. Was it you? Thank you very much, because what you have done, you gave me the opportunity of saying thank you to somebody who became a sister to me and let me carry on in life in a way and a normal family. Thank you. So we have a tribute from somebody who worked with um, Ross been taken for, for many, many years at the at the Royal Master. Please please all listen, it's it's oh, it's you. so important. Um I stand on the stage as well. <laughs> <laughs> so hello. Uh, I'm called John Glees and I'm an oncologist and I worked for 40 years at the Marvels and I was trained by Ros in planning. And today my colleagues from all over the world are thinking about Ross. There's Dr. Mascaro in, uh, New Mex in Mexico City. There's Dr. Lewinsky, the father of Monica Lewinsky, who was also trained at Marsden. He's an oncologist. You know Monica Lewinsky, a famous clinical yes. yes. Dr. Hebbard, Dr. Kalman. The whole era of the 70s and 80s, Ross taught, and she was highly professional. She was extremely clever and great fun. And the Marsden gave wonderful parties in those days. And I was a good dancer, so she always made sure that she and I danced together. And Roz was always splendidly dressed, showing her nice cleavage. And she had lovely silver dresses and lovely shoes. And she was exemplary in her profession. She knew all the latest techniques and when I worked for Dr. Lederman, who was director of the radiation department at Fulham Road, he said to me, please go to Miss Tago, she will teach you how to plan a larynx. He was a head and neck radiotherapist. And he did gynecological oncology and head and neck oncology. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Lederman, how come you do both? Because um, Gynecology is one end, as you know, and head and neck the other. He said, please, it's obvious I can look into both ends and, and see the cancers getting better. And he was, of course, right. When you treat cancer of the cervix, you can see it getting better. Every week you inspect how the radiation is doing. So I learned a lot from them. And just to tell you a few little highlights, Ros would insist 
that you came, or Ra Rosamond, Ros we call her, Ros, would insist we came to the planning very quickly. She was impatient to get on with it. She said the patient's waiting on the table. And she had a very large pair of scissors. And she would say, I snip them off if you don't do the work. <laughs> and she was very intimidating in that way, but she never did snip it off. But, um, <laughs> I still have nightmares about it. <laughs> and Ros had a very private side. I didn't know much about her family, and my meeting them today it gives me much pleasure. But I was terribly pleased to come here because we all loved Ros, and she was terribly special at the master. You must know that. She was clever, she was a pretty to look at, she was articulate, and they all loved her, and she knew what she was talking about. She was clever, 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 and she had to plan cancer treatments all over the body. And I said, Ros, now that you're in heaven, you'll be able to teach planning there, because many people, many people are in heaven because they were incorrectly planned. And, and, and the cancer tumor was missed, and you'll be able to correct them and make them better. So with that thought, I say thanks very much that I'm here. Great privilege to be with you all. And I think very fondly of Roz now, as we, as we all do. Thank you so much.
So myself and my cousin, if they have to push it outside from the kitchen. We only came in to do the washing up. They ate the food, they didn't leave any for us. After I finished my hairdressing school, now I started doing her hair for her every weekend. She would come in with different kinds of things. Do this, do that. At the end of 30 minutes, she would say, well, I don't like this style, change it. <laughs> we'll change the style. They will sit and eat. We are not invited to do. We only wash up. <coughs> One day I did the hairstyle for her. She said she was doing something. My mother said, okay, I will meet you so and so and so. She came back less than 30 minutes. What happened? She said there were bed two on my head. That means the spray we use is not good. The hair spray is not good. <laughs> so the bed two on my head. I said, okay, so what do you say? You have to wash it and start all over again. I said, okay, I will do that. So at the end of the day, that means you have to put a, a, a cap on so that when you go under the bridge, no bed will pull under your head. She said, no, it was the hairspray you used. It was the hairspray you used. That was why I was having that problem. I said, okay. She got home and she called and she said, then Honestly, you, you are very patient. I said, well, auntie, I can't say anything, but it's you. And that is what I have to do. But this, <coughs> Auntie Rosemont, rest in peace. Oh. I could not say anything. When I saw the, the note or whatever, the fly, I was shocked. I couldn't say anything to my mom because my mother wasn't feeling well. Who, why, why, how am I going to say this to her? It was through Auntie Rose that we went to Ram, Mazin, Chelsea, and Westminster. I said, Connie, Connie, come, 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 come. This is not tight here. look after you. I said, what about us? He said, you people, you haven't grown. Leave your mother. Let your mother come. I said, ah, ma, but we are all helping. He said, no, you sit there. I will call this doctor. You speak to your mom or bring your mom at this time. Then the doctor will say to her, she is a very lovely woman. I must say that. Until Rose is in the last week. Make sure you go to Good evening, everybody. Um, just a short message to compliment what's already been said about Antina. Um, she was a very well groomed, well dressed lady. Definitely a lady of class. Um, she was ever so kind. Um, she will also let you know your shortfalls um, at any given time. But um, I have very good fond memories of her, especially visits to Howard's, where, to be honest, the staff members even knew her, um, which was quite impressive. <laughs> um, also spending time going to her flat, helping her with um, just small chores, what have you. Um, there were dinners with her as well, and um, to be honest, most of it's been said already, but um, she will be highly remembered for um, being an, um, a wonderful woman. So that's me. I am uh, the first cousin of Antina. And even though she was our first cousin, my sister here, Aris Raza, please. We uh, traveled from U.S. to come for this uh, program uh, in, in sadness. Actually, Antina's mother and our father uh, were brother and sister. And we've kept in touch over the course of the, the years. Uh, our uncles came to visit us in U.S. as well. but. Uh, I'm just thanking God for her life and the passion that she actually had for her family. Uh, she was more or less the, the memory brain of the, the family. She always connected with each and every person, uh, not only on father's side, but only on mom's side as well. And all of uh, the table here are cousins of this as well. So we just wanted to come in and say something about her. Uh, I just thank God because she was a woman who was quite bold. Uh, she was fearless, but she really feared the Lord. And uh, I know that over the course of the past few months, we had uh, actually called her and prayed with her. 
And so I'm just thankful to God for allowing us to have that time, that quality time of prayer on the phone until she became more sick and she was admitted into the hospital bed. I thank each and every one of you for, for being present here and I thank those who also uh, collaborated and organized this program and may God bless each and every one of you. See you. 